Why, God? Do you often find yourself asking that question, why, God? Followed by spending time in in wonder, like the lyrics of that last song we just heard, wondering why people pass away when they do, especially for those who are much too young to do so in our perspective. Or do you wonder why people fall apart and relationships become strained and broken? Do you wonder why people lose hope and become lonely and depressed? Or like the Eyes to See series has been highlighting for us, why is it that so many people suffer from living in poverty? Or perhaps most relevant for today, for this very moment, potentially the greatest wonder of all across the globe, when is life going to get back to normal? Or beyond that, maybe you wonder, what really is normal to begin with? Why, God, does any of this stuff happen at all? Questions like these can cause us to wonder and can easily lead us to worry. But this wonder, these often unanswered questions, they shouldn't always be perceived as negatives, nor should they deter us in our faith in God and lead us to worry. Although there are so many things in this lifetime that we are just simply not meant to know or to fully understand, there is one thing that these questions and this wonder could and should lead us to. As sung about in that previous song, which was titled, Why God? This wonder should propel us towards God's fully extended arms over and over and over again. See, wonder is such a beautiful thing if perceived correctly. And if perceived correctly, it can draw us closer to our loving God and Savior, Jesus So may we begin this morning by praising God and simply raising a hallelujah for his love and his willingness to be present in our lives in all circumstances, all the time. He is such a good, good God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, welcome to HSM Sunday. My name is Dylan Harper, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of offering leadership to our high school ministry youth here at Hope Fellowship. And let me just say what a blessing it is. As you can probably grasp from this service already, you know, we have a group of young people here who love Jesus, who are committed to God and his plans for their lives, and have the clear, competent ability to change the world around them for Christ's sake. And you see, it is Christ in them, the hope of glory mixed with their talents and their gifts and their passions that make this all possible. It is such a beautiful thing to witness and such a beautiful thing to be a part of. Now, back in September of 2019, we embarked into this year's ministry season with a theme of wonder in hand. And the goal has been to help the youth grow in their faith by thinking more critically about Jesus and their faith in general through this lens of wonder. And so by way of simply asking questions and having discussions, our hope has been that they would continue to develop ownership of their faith, that it might grow and blossom and bear fruit, which it has. And so to do this, we even chose a theme verse for the year, which is Mark 9 verse 15. And so today we are looking into that verse along with the previous verse 14 and some necessary before and after context. So if you have your Bible in arms reach there at home or wherever you are, I would encourage you to to pull out your Bible right now, start turning or swiping to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 9 starting in verse 14. And with God's word open before us here this morning, may we take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your presence wherever we are. We thank you that you are a good, good Father in every circumstance. And we pray, Lord, this morning that uh, your spirit would minister to our hearts, that it would help illuminate this word 
in our hearts and in our minds so that we could see and we could hear everything it is that you want us to hear through this message. And Lord, I pray that your word would be heard in a way that would transform our lives from the inside out. And Lord, I pray that if there be anything in me that would prevent your word from being heard, that you would remove it from my mind and my lips right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray all these things. Amen. Mark 9, verse 14. When they came back to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. This is the word of the Lord for today. And all of God's people say, Amen. Now allow me to unpack what exactly is taking place here in Mark 9 surrounding these two verses. And may I just point out as sort of a side note that um, the gospel author Mark, he often writes in a way very intentionally to ensure that Jesus remains the focus, the center of attention for us, the reader. And so if we read carefully, we may very well see that Jesus is the focus of all these verses, especially in the first half of Mark 9. And Mark 9 uh, it details two separate events which occur, you know, one before Mark uh, 9, 14 and 15, and one after. And so the disciples here are split into two different groups. One group is up on a mountaintop experiencing one of the strangest yet glorious moments of their lives with Jesus, better known as the Transfiguration, while the other group is down at the bottom of the mountain experiencing one of their less glorious moments without Jesus, the failure of delivering a possessed child. Now up on the mountaintop, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his inner circle of disciples, and what they experience up there is God's glory in its purest form, a sight that very few people on this side of heaven actually get to see. Now keeping in mind that Jesus is both fully divine and fully human, meaning that he is God and he is man, both at the same time while here on earth, what happens in this moment is what's called the transfiguration. It's kind of like, you know, God's glory is fully revealed through Jesus. It's almost as if all humanity, the human side of Jesus, is removed and the three disciples are exposed to God's, like, literal, unhindered presence, his perfect glory. And Mark describes this glory seen in Jesus as being radiant and exceedingly white, like no launderer on earth could whiten. See, this pureness of the color white was such a rare sight back then because, well, it was always, you know, dusty and dirty, you know, hot and sweaty, and their ability to clean clothes was nothing like our ability today to simply, you know, pull out a, a Tide on the Go bleach stick and neutralize a stain. No, you know, this was whiter and brighter than anything anyone had ever seen before. But back down at the bottom of the mountain, something much different was taking place. There was a crowd of people gathered around the other nine disciples who were painstakingly trying to deliver and heal a young boy uh, from what we might call today epilepsy. But they were failing, unable to accomplish this supernatural feat in the name of Jesus through their humanity. Luckily, though, for both the nine disciples and the boy, Jesus himself enters onto the scene like a, a pinch hitter in the ninth inning facing a full count. But Jesus, he doesn't strike out, no. He delivers, quite literally, you know, hitting a home run for his team by delivering um, the boy and, and healing the boy and essentially bailing out his disciples from a very potentially, um, you know, shameful and disastrous situation. Now, what connects these two separate events, one up on the mountaintop and one down below, is our two verses here today. A transition from the mountaintop down to the crowd. Verse 14 describes Jesus and his three disciples coming back down off that mountaintop to meet up with the other nine who are surrounded by this crowd um, watching them try to heal this boy. And that's when we come across our HSM theme verse. Mark 9 verse 15 as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Like immediately, these people, they see Jesus and they take off running towards him. 
That's all it took. They saw him and they were drawn to him. Now Mark here uses a word for the, um, how the people saw Jesus, a, a word for saw, a Greek word that represents more than just simply seeing him with their physical eyes. Yes, it does mean that, but it also means to experience, to perceive, to discern in this like metaphorical type of way. It's as if they saw Jesus with their mind, you know, like they, they spiritually saw him somehow and they were drawn to what they saw, like a moth at night being drawn to that brightest light. And this wasn't just a small, mediocre gathering of people. The word Mark uses for people here represents a multitude, a mob, a throng, a riot. Surely you've never heard of a, a small handful of people gathered described as a, a riot or a mob, right? Like this isn't your average Sunday afternoon life group gathering. You know, in my mind, what I picture when I hear this word is something that I expected to see last year on September 20th. You know, in, in Nevada, maybe you remember, maybe you don't, but there were millions of people who responded online and were expected to storm Area 51. Yeah, now you probably remember, right? Now, in my mind, that's what I imagine this, this throng of people, you know, charging towards Jesus because of what they saw in him. Now that is a multitude of people. So what is it that the, the people saw in Jesus? You know, Mark doesn't tell us what exactly they saw in him, but he does describe how it impacted them. And the way he describes it is quite unique. In fact, Mark is the only gospel author um, to use this particular verbal phrase, that the crowd was overwhelmed with wonder. Other translations in your Bible might say that they were filled with awe, or that they were greatly or utterly amazed. And this verse can be described exactly like that, like being greatly or utterly astonished or awestruck, you know, overwhelmed with wonder. Can you think of a time in your life when you saw something so astonishing that your jaw basically dropped to the ground and you were awestruck, you know, filled with wonder, overwhelmed with wonder, almost frozen in time for a moment? You know, one event that I often am reminded of is September 11th, 2001. The images of those jets crashing into the Twin Towers in New York is something that still stops me dead in my tracks today. And you know, it does fill me with a sense of wonder, wondering why something like that even had to happen. Or another example, you know, kind of on the lighter side of the spectrum, perhaps you've seen the Lego movie that was released a few years ago. I think it was 2014. And there's this scene where the main male character, um, a man named Emmett, he sees for the very first time the main female character, uh, Lucy, or AKA Wild Style. And the animation comes to this sort of dizzying halt in slow motion where we, we witness Emmett going, uh, as he stares at Lucy. You know, it's, it's kind of like that. It's this split second moment frozen in time, which might feel like an eternity for the individual in the moment. But what happens is we're just completely awestruck. We're overwhelmed with wonder. And this is exactly how the crowd responds to seeing Jesus. They are awestruck. They are filled with awe. They were overwhelmed with wonder, and they instantly begin running towards him. Now, the question for us in Mark 9, 15 exclusively is, you know, what did the people see in Jesus? That which caused them to respond this way, to immediately run to him. But the question for us today, right now, isn't so much about what we see in Jesus, because, you know, we live in a time where Jesus is already back up in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. And so we aren't going to get a chance to see him in the flesh in the, the same capacity that these people did back then. So really, our question is, first and foremost, do we even see Jesus in the world? And if we do, where? 
Where do we see Jesus in the world today? This is a question that I asked the youth recently on one of our Zoom gatherings. I said, in one word, describe where you currently see Jesus in the world. Many of you watching here today will relate to their responses, which were things like, I see Jesus in nature. I see Jesus in community with, with friends and family, whether we're you know, together or socially distant. I see Jesus in the frontline healthcare workers. And but a particular favorite of mine was, I see Jesus in the peace. You know, even though many people today may not be experiencing that inner personal peace right now, the world has been forced to slow down to a certain extent where there seems to be this new level or, or measure of peace that is present in the atmosphere. And yes, Jesus is being found in that. So where do you see Jesus in the world today? You know, if you're with someone right now, I'd ask that you turn to them and tell them in one word where you see Jesus in the world today. Go for it right now. I'll give you a second. Now, the next week on our Zoom gathering, I followed up with another question for the youth. This one was a little more challenging, though. So I decided that I would share a couple of scriptures beforehand to help get their, you know, critical thinking juices flowing. So first I shared a good hearty, you know, identity type of reminder from Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, which says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then I followed up with a scripture from 2 Corinthians, which applies, you know, some pressure to really lean in and think critically about this question. So hear this from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I then ask them this question. Where do you see Jesus in yourself? Now as challenging as this question is, the youth came through after a, just a brief moment of self-evaluation, offering some fantastic responses. They said things like this. I see Jesus in my joy. I see Jesus in my laughter, in my, my positivity. I see Jesus in my ability to encourage others and spread this joy and these positive vibes. I see Jesus in my courage to share the gospel and to pray for others. I see Jesus in my willingness to accept God's promptings in my life, whether it be, you know, small little things like favors or big life decisions. And I see Jesus in my lack of fearing those uncertainties. I see Jesus in my leadership qualities, even if I can be a little bossy at times. I see Jesus in my gentle and discerning spirit. I see Jesus when I use my musical giftings, playing an instrument. Uh, I see Jesus in my hospitality, in my serving, in my writing. I mean, these young people, they really thought critically about this question. And I hope if you're listening today, you will do the same. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, to examine yourself, to test yourself, to see if you really are in the faith. I, for one, believe that you are. But you've got to ask yourself, you know, where do you see Jesus in your own life? And this is important for today to wonder about Jesus within you because as we've journeyed together through the Eyes to See series over the past five weeks, along with reading the weekday devotions, you know, if there's been anything revealed to us, at least for me, it's the reality that much of the world we live in is a broken and impoverished place that needs Jesus. And as Christ followers, we are such a big part of the solution to this problem. We have Jesus alive in us right now. We are image bearers of Christ and his love and his compassion for the world. That is who we are. 
And so God is calling us to live in such a way for such a time as this that the world, the crowds, the multitudes, the people might look at us and see something similar to that which the people saw in Jesus at the bottom of that mountain. And although, you know, we may never truly know for certain what the people saw in Jesus, that which overwhelmed them with wonder, many theologians today believe that what they saw was a glimpse of that unhindered glory that was revealed to those three disciples on the top of that mountain during the transfiguration. It was that glory that overwhelmed them with wonder and caused them to run to Jesus. And you know what? God's word tells us today in Colossians chapter verse 1, ch chapter 1 verse 27, that he has chosen us to help make known the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. Amen? I mean, is that not the best thing you've heard all week? That Christ in you is the hope of glory here on earth. I mean, hallelujah. That is amazing. You see, the people saw God's glory in Jesus roughly 2,000 years ago. And today, God is reminding us that that same glory resides in us in order to overwhelm others with wonder and to offer them hope. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to do more in order for people to see it. It's not about trying to meet more needs and be super, super busy serving all the time. No. Although that is good stuff, what God is saying today is that we are meant to live a consistent lifestyle of compassion, a consistent lifestyle of justice, of kindness, of, of mercy, not doing more, but instead becoming more, becoming more like Jesus by following him and allowing his love to continue transforming our lives as we say yes and amen to him and all of his ways. Can I get another amen here this morning? This is the good news, people. He's created each and every one of us unique with gifts and talents and skills and passions in order to respond to the needs of this world. Perhaps as you take in this service, you may even notice different gifts and talents that the youth even have. Gifts that are meeting the needs to provide for this service here, this church service that exists to glorify God and to offer hope to the world. This is the wonder that I desire for everyone to see and to hear today. From asking those why God questions, to pondering about Jesus out in the world and Jesus in ourselves, the hope of glory, and ultimately, the wonder of how being an image bearer of Christ and his love can impact the world around us. Our God is a God of wonders. And I believe he is calling us today to wonder how the reflection of his love and his compassion can meet the needs of the world around us. That love and that compassion that exists in us. And so when HSM kicked off this ministry season, we distributed a, a wonder-themed bookmark with a prayer on it. A prayer for the youth to memorize and to recite. And you know, I, I'm so proud of the youth because I can stand here today and I can tell you how many of them, you know, proved their memory gifts by memorizing and then reciting this prayer on Wednesday nights in person when we gathered. It was unbelievable. And what I'd like to do here this morning in, in closing is I'd like for you to receive this prayer. You know, may this be my prayer for you. May this be our prayer, the HSM prayer for you here, all watching and listening today. Lord, I pray. Give me the ears to hear and eyes to see of that which I cannot. To hear your voice and see your face is all I really want. Those things in life that when revealed, I find that you are under. Lead me to a life of love that makes me run to you in wonder. Amen. Amen. Almond. Amen. Amen.